So, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks to all of you for getting up this early. I know that's uh, that's sacrifice, also for me. I'm a hacker, you know. So, uh, anyway, I'm going to talk to you guys uh, today about pen testing chat ops. I'm just really curious, show of hands in the room, who here has actually heard of chat ops? Uh, I see a few half hands. Okay. <coughs> that's actually surprisingly few people. So. By the way, sorry if I'm uh, sounding a little quiet today. I think I'm a little bit sick today. So, Anyway, but uh, first, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about myself and uh, my background. So I am a former academic. I used to be a uh, assistant professor of computer science at the Free University of Amsterdam. And uh, at the time, I did uh, research in uh, security and privacy of radio frequency identification. And uh, back in 2006, I had the distinction of being the first person to write a piece of malware for RFID tags. So, a uh, bit of trivia, trivia there. Um, I then uh, built a uh, sort of like a firewall and uh, spoofing and jamming device. This was in about 2007, 2008, back, uh, back when like RFID tag cloners weren't just like available, uh, <laughs> you know, on the internet. Um, so, yeah, so I, that was my research for a while. Uh, at a certain point, I left uh, academia and I went over to the industry. I worked as an engineering manager for a while uh, on the Zen Hypervisor team at Citrix. And then after that, I left and I worked uh, at, at the CCERT team in uh, ING Bank. So, uh, after about uh, a year and a half at ING, I decided that I wanted to start my own company. So I created this thing called uh, Radically Open Security. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that organization just because it's a little bit tied together with the actual tooling and technology that we're using. So it's somewhat relevant. So Radically Open Security itself is actually a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company. Not-for-profit. <laughs> so uh, sounds a bit strange. Actually, it is. <laughs> Uh, the reason why I did it was because when I worked at ING, I dealt with some security consultancy companies and was absolutely horrified at how commercial they were. <laughs> and uh, I basically wanted to try and create an organization that did things really differently, sort of like, you know, for the hacker community, <laughs> by the hacker community for everybody, to actually try and reclaim uh, security consultancy from the big corporates, you know, and instead. So we're, we're set up as a not-for-profit, and basically 90% of our profits contractually uh, go to the NLNet Foundation. And NLNet is a Dutch foundation that uh, has supported things like uh, GNU uh, and EFF and Tor and Jitsi and, you know, <laughs> basically anything uh, that's uh, sort of good for the internet. They've done a lot with uh, DNSSEC and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, and by setting it up that way, I deliberately wanted to create an organization that could sort of do security consultancy in the right ways with the right incentives. Um, so uh, the other thing also is that uh, we are very much committed to openness and transparency. Uh, of course, these are also very much uh, ideals, you know, from the open source community, but also from the hacker community itself. And one of the things that really bothered me, that was really kind of my big pet peeve when I was dealing with security consultancy companies, is how they operated like these black boxes. So in the security field, uh, anyways, it, you know, if you've ever read anything by Bruce Schneier, you're going to know that you know, anything that's a black box is basically snake oil. Because <laughs> you know, all the best stuff is going to be inspected by the best brains in the world. <laughs> you know. uh, but on top of that, you know, it was just the attitudes of these companies that sort of swooped in. They're like, we're the experts. Stand back. This is really hard. We're just going to solve everything for you and then give you this report and a huge bill at the end. You know, and, and I was working at ING Bank, and I was in the C cert, and I was like, okay, well, it's my job, you know, to make ING better, you know, to, to improve its security posture, to keep people like you and me from, you know, not having our bank accounts hacked all the time. So, you know, so I was like, you know, if you guys are so lead, you know, then, you know, you probably won't mind my looking over your shoulder because, hey, you know, maybe I can learn something from you. But then they were like, no, but really, it's really hard. Really, and I, I was like, you know, I'm a, I'm a former assistant professor of computer sec computer security. Try me, <laughs> you know. But they deliberately obscured things, and they threw away bash history logs. They deliberately worked in screen and forgot to turn on logging after I reminded them ten times. <laughs> 
You know, and at the end of the day, I like literally physically stood and looked over their shoulder. I was just being a pain in the rear end, you know, and they couldn't get rid of me because I was physically there. And of course, they were using the same open source tools as everyone else. <laughs> you know, but they don't want you to know that <laughs> because they think if they can cultiv cultivate some kind of weird dependency, you know, and, and, you know, that, and, and, and prevent you from being educated, that they can make more money that way. Which I think at the end of the day, a is completely ridiculous, and B, it's sort of missing the point of why you hire security consultants in in the first place. <laughs> you know, so I created uh, radically open security with the whole idea of trying to take the black box of consulting and to be able to explode it inside out. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, and uh, well, our, our our tooling is is somewhat integral to that, uh, which of course now is the, is the uh, part that I'm going to get to. So that brings us then uh, to the topic of chat ops. So uh, what is chat ops? So very few hands were raised before when I asked. So chat ops is a concept that was pioneered by the company GitHub. So GitHub is a distributed company. I believe they have an office in the Bay Area, but they have staff all over the place globally. You know. Very modern, very open sourcey, of course. <laughs> and uh, ultimately, uh, what they do is they use their chat as the command and control center for their DevOps. So what they do is, uh, if they have a sysadmin team, they can actually uh, deploy, uh, you know, new servers or you know, uh, make new builds of the website or basically their entire cont continuous integration cycle and all of the feedback that they get and the metrics and, and the tooling. Basically, everything is launchable from the chat. So you're basically taking your chat room and almost turning it into a command line. OK? Now, the really, really nice thing about this is that it enables you, if you have a distributed team, to be able to intersperse talk, so conversation between humans, with actual commands you know, machine commands that you're using to actually get stuff done in your operations. So basically, you could do something, and then you can get feedback from it, and then you can actually comment on it and have some discussion about it, and then you can do some more. And in such a way, it's actually a really great way of uh, coordinating the work amongst people who are distributed, and also making the work visible, <laughs> you know? Because that way, you know, People can actually see what other people have done. You know, <laughs> you don't need to ask from, "Hey, have you uh, done this and that?" Because you can basically just look in the chat room and see it. And you can also create all kinds of different chat rooms to sort of segment it up into different customers or different projects or you know <laughs> that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I, I believe that GitHub uh, uses uh, Campfire, I think, for their chat. Uh, we we use something called Rocket Chat. So who here has ever used Slack or something similar? Uh, Half the people. I'm surprised, not more. So, okay, Slack is, you know, a very cool system. It looks somewhat like this, uh, and it's basically just, uh, you know, uh, I would say a glorified IRC client, but, uh, <laughs> but, but actually, it's just a uh, just a more graphically. It, it's just a really neat uh, web-based chat interface, and uh, there's also mobile apps uh, that you can use, and it's actually a great way if, if you're working with developers to be able to coordinate the work. So. It's all well and good with Slack, except for the fact that I run a security company. <laughs> you know, and as the t-shirt says, there is no cloud, there's only other people's computers. <laughs> you know, and I do not want my customer's pen test data going onto Slack servers. <laughs> so we use this open source, self-hosted Slack clone called Rocket Chat. So it's an open source project. I would absolutely highly recommend that everybody here check out Rocket Chat. It's every bit as fantastic as Slack, and, and you control your data. It's got all the integrations and everything, too. So, um, so you can see the screenshot here. This is actually what, uh, what Rocket Chat looks like. So it gives you a bit of an idea of uh, what the interface looks like. But anybody here who's used Slack will recognize this uh, immediately. So uh, the other part of chat ops is uh, it's not just that you're using a chat room, but you're actually using a chat bot. So perhaps you guys remember the days, again, of, of IRC, back when there used to be IRC bots uh, that you were able to uh, interface with. Well, these chat bots are exactly the same thing, except that they also work with these uh, more modern Slack-like clients. So the particular uh, chat bot that we use is called Hubot, H-U-B-O-T. And this also uh, is open source, and it was developed by GitHub. 
So this chatbot <laughs> is essentially what allows us to be able to uh, control our operations uh, via the chat room. <laughs> So uh, it accepts commands, it uh, can uh, spit the output uh, back into the channel, <laughs> you know, and for the rest you basically just invoke it uh, by saying the name of the bot. In our case uh, we call it uh, raw spot since we're radically open security. Uh, so, you know, and there's all kinds of different commands that you can have from the completely and utterly useless, you know, to the useful. <laughs> so an example of an utterly useless command is uh, we've got, you can see here, uh, John Sinter is saying raw spot Pug me. And then Rossbot prints a picture of a pug. <laughs> Completely useless, <laughs> but a lot of fun. <laughs> you know? So, and of course fun is important because that's part of building the culture of your company as well. <laughs> so, uh, but of course there's, uh, there's far more useful things uh, that you can do uh, than just, you know, print pictures of pugs. I mean, well, nothing, nothing against pugs, but. Um, so, and. After seeing a uh, presentation from GitHub uh, about, yeah, gosh, now it was probably about two and a half years ago, I think, but uh, it was like it was like the clouds had parted for me. I, I saw this presentation uh, and I was like, this is it. Oh my God, this would be so awesome for pen testing and for security. <laughs> so, uh, so I basically ran home uh, after seeing this uh, presentation by GitHub at the DevOps days. Uh, where they were showing Hubots. And I said immediately to my system administrator, we are setting this up and we are going to like try this, you know, immediately. So basically the first thing uh, that we did is uh, with a default uh, install of uh, Hubots, you can get all kinds of uh, different things. So uh, uh, there's some standard things like uh, being able to, uh, uh, well, uh, get images or uh, do Google queries or, uh, you know, even just do silly things uh, like games. But of course, one of the first things we wanted to know is, you know, can we, for example, hook up Nmap? <laughs> you know, because again, we're doing this for security applications. Uh, so, and, and in, indeed, uh, we basically uh, wrote some code where we were able to invoke uh, Nmap from the chat, and then actually be able to then get the output and then parse it in such a way that uh, we can make it useful to the people that were uh, doing the pen testing. And we were like, cool. So, um, but there's lots of other things uh, that you can actually do with it as well. So, reporting, for example. So, every pen tester hates documentation. A lot of programmers too, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is the least fun of your, uh, you know, uh, of your job as a pen tester. And anything that you can do to automate it uh, and make it more efficient and l less painful uh, is complete and total win. And it's not just win, it actually also saves the company money as well because it makes you more efficient. So us, like every other pen testing company in the universe, created our own uh, pen test report automation system. <laughs> so uh, essentially we've got the system and first of all we open sourced it. Uh, second of all we actually made it an OWASP project. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with OWASP, if you're not, you should Google it. Maybe you've heard of the OWASP top, top 10, anyway. But uh, in either case, uh, so it's called Pentext, uh, OWASP Pentext. So, and um, this system basically is as such that we can actually put in uh, an A4's worth of XML, and then, for example, for just from that, we can generate a 13-page quotation. <laughs> then with a command that we've implemented from the chat room, we can actually clone the pen test repo from the quotation repo. <laughs> and once we have the pen test repo, people can actually put in their findings via issues in GitLab. <laughs> and then we actually have a conversion script that converts that into XML. And then that adds all the necessary boilerplate that then uh, can compile it into a PDF. Super easy. <laughs> so. Uh, again, we've open sourced this whole system, so if any of you guys ever have a need for such a system, feel free to steal it. Uh, that's what, what open source is for. Um, it's also well documented, uh, but you can see here an example of uh, the uh, XML, which yeah, is XML. But, uh, you know, well, you can see section IDs and, the, and that kind of thing. But uh, more importantly, when you compile it, then it prints, uh, creates something that looks a bit like this, which basically is the kind of standard report uh, that you would receive from any you know commercial pen test company, if you want to use it yourself, just replace you know the logo, you know, and then you guys can customize it uh, for your own purposes. But the cool thing again is that we have actually 
uh, implemented things as such that we can invoke all of this from the chat. So, uh, yeah, I have, to, I have to update this slide, actually. We uh, depreciated. By the way, you see here raw spot shell command. The very first thing we did was uh, test the input sanitiz sanitization on that thing, just uh, saying as an aside. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, we basically had, uh, yeah, right, nowadays the command's actually called raw spot uh, builder, but uh, what we basically can create, do this command, <clears throat> and then it actually takes the XML, it compiles it, so it clones the repo, it invokes the tool chain, and then it actually spits out a, a clickable URL, and if you click on it, then you basically have your report. So this is actually a really easy way of actually without installing the tool chain on your machine <laughs> to be able to, uh, you know, just basically put in a command, get a clickable link back, that's it. And the actual mechanics of sort of setting up the tool chain, maintaining the tool chain, put, doing security updates, et cetera, et cetera, is all handled by our sysadmin staff. Now the really nice thing about this is because it's a, a chat-based interface and all you need is a web browser, it means that you can very easily onboard new staff members and you actually don't have to set anything up for them. So all you have to do is they log in uh, via their web browser uh, and then uh, once they're logged in, they, they can immediately start issuing commands in the chat or clicking on the links or, or following you know, along with what's happening. It, it takes actually the cost of onboarding new people and puts it down almost to zero, <laughs> at least in terms of, uh, of, of setting up systems for them, <laughs> you know, because it's all centrally managed on the server in the back end. So that's actually really super. And you know, it's useful for uh, pen testing, but it could very well also be useful for the kinds of companies that you guys work for. So think about that. Uh, the other thing, uh, by the way, that it's also nice for is, and, and I mentioned before about the whole openness and transparency thing. So at Radically Open Security, we've got this concept called peek over our shoulder. So POOS is what we call it, uh, of course inspired by the incident that I told you guys about. Uh, but what it is, is we actually invite customers into our chat room and while we're working, they can actually listen to what the pen testers are, are talking about so they can overhear the conversation that's happening. They can actually also chat along, think along, brainstorm along with the pen testers. And then uh, basically at every moment in time, we've got the chat bot basically synced with uh, GitLab. So every time there's an update to GitLab issues or there's a commit uh, you know, that's done to the GitLab repo, the chat bot announces it. So it basically says, you know, pen tester just pushed commit number whatever, you know, to the GitLab repo, click here so you can see it. So basically every, you know, pr probably, you know, a while, probably a few times an hour while the pen testers are working, the customers are getting constant updates about what's happening. <laughs> you know, and they can hear the totality of the conversation that's happening because we're a distributed online company with a geographically distributed team. So they can basically overhear everything we're saying because, well, I mean, ch the chat is our main communication channel. <laughs> you know, there's no conversation happening in a physical room somewhere. So because that I, of that, it basically takes that black box and completely explodes it, you know, inside out. And on top of that, you know, with the clickable links, even the customer can click on it. <laughs> and, and, and there's no cost of onboarding the customer. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of what makes it uh, really easy, <laughs> you know, then to be able to include your customers in the process. And, you know, for us, we can use that in so many different ways. You know, we can use it for the actual pen testing process. We can also use it for incident response, which we've done that uh, before. And we also even use it for the quotation process, which might sound a little bit strange. But uh, before we actually have uh, a signed contract, what we can do is we can let them into the chat room, <laughs> again, sort of let them in uh, into the conversation that we're ha having during the scoping process. And my personal experience also with scoping is because scoping is usually a two-way conversation. You know, it, part of it is the requirements of the customer, but the requirements, their requirements are oftentimes are also in conflict with their budget. <laughs> and trying to find the proper balance of that usually requires their input. You know, if you try guessing, you're probably going to guess wrong. <laughs> ultimately, you just kind of need to, to ask them. <laughs> you know, and ultimately, they're going to tell you what, where the fine line is, and you basically just have to illuminate what the trade-offs are. Again, I don't think this just applies to security. <laughs> but this is the process then that we use, and we 
let the customers into the chat room, and they can literally see us making different builds of their quotation. <laughs> you know, and we can basically say, okay, well, we just made a new one. Does this 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 this, this look look okay to you? No, actually, we could you change the name here, and can you you know, <laughs> actually, can you adjust this from three days to two days, or you know, whatever? A and it actually allows us, you know, to also because we're doing it in chat to have a much faster turnaround time. <laughs> For these things too, because ultimately uh, things like you know telephone and email are extremely high latency. <laughs> you know, I mean, you send an email and then you know they're in, they're, pr they're probably in a meeting and then it takes you know a half day to, to to get back to them and then maybe they didn't see it or you know also with phone calls trying to actually schedule meetings where everybody's calendar is synced. You know that that can be really inefficient. But the nice thing about chat in a Slack-like environment is it's completely asynchronous. So if people have a spare moment, <laughs> they can just log in, <laughs> you know? And then when they're not available, then they just aren't there. Then they're just logged out. But we also, by the way, can also have, um, if you get mentions or direct uh, messages, you can also get email notifications of that, that as well, letting people know to log in, to have a look. Anyway, so, uh, but all of that is super useful, not just for being able to coordinate amongst our own staff members, but also for being able to uh, coordinate uh, with the customers. <laughs> and again, it's useful for us. This kind of thing might be useful for you guys too. So, uh, okay, so uh, GitLab, I already mentioned that, uh, that GitLab is a sort of part of our uh, combination of tools that we use. Uh, this is an example of what one of our pen test uh, repositories uh, might look like. Uh, in our case, just to divide it up into relevant things for us, like findings, non-findings, uh, et cetera. Uh, other kinds of tools also can be integrated into the chat. So at a certain point, we created a tool that could uh, coordinate dis different kinds of passive scanning. So if you guys are familiar with things like uh, Shodan or uh, you know, Census, you know, Scans.io, that kind of thing, uh, those are basically scanning tools that allow you to see some vulnerabilities uh, without actually actively probing a website. So we built a tool that can take that uh, information and, and correlate it. We open sourced the tool, by the way, so this is uh, a screenshot from our GitHub uh, repository. And we made that so we could also launch that from our chat. So we can actually take a huge percentage of our tool set and then integrate that into our chat. Another concept that we came up with was something that we called red-blue pen testing. So I'm sure you guys, uh, of course, have heard of red teaming and blue teaming. <coughs> Some of you might also be familiar with Capture the Flag. So what we actually do <coughs> is we take people's penetration tests and we gamify them. So what we do is we can take a group of about a dozen like uh, developers, uh, sysadmins, DevOps people, we can divide them into two teams. It can either be a red team and a blue team, or a red team and a red team. And each of these teams uh, of about a, you know six people per team is guided by one of our professional pen testers. And what we actually do is, in you know three days to a week, we actually allow the coders, you know, to pen test their own product, you know, under guidance of professionals. <laughs> now, the most common comment uh, that we get after doing these red-blue pen tests is coder saying to us, I will never look at code the same way again. <laughs> you know, and this is precisely <laughs> what you want to hear. <laughs> because it's actually taking the coders out of their usual role <laughs> you know, of being a coder. It puts them in the role of being a hacker for a short period of time. And, uh, you know, if you come in as a third party and you break people's stuff, if you say you have a problem, then you know, people are going to say, nope, no problem, <laughs> nope, it's all good. But the thing is, if, if people hack it themselves, <laughs> then they're proud. <laughs> they're all like, oh my god, look, I did that, you know? <laughs> and uh, you know, they really enjoy it, you know? I mean, and we actually gamify it with a scoreboard and everything. So these two teams are actually competing against each other to hack their own products <laughs> and scoring points for it. So you can actually see some of the gamification that we did uh, with, the, uh, with the chat bot. And you can see here, for example, Rossbot incremented blue 24 points. And then you can see uh, after that it, uh, it says uh, that blue has 24 points uh, and it prints out some motivational image. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, geeks uh, like this kind of stuff. <laughs> 
And, uh, but most importantly, actually for the cost of uh, two man weeks of pen tester time, which you know, generally is what you, would, you would, would be required for a pen test anyways, I mean, you actually get not just a pen test, but also a training exercise for a dozen people. <laughs> you know, and it actually doesn't cost us any extra work. <laughs> you know? OK, well, we have to clean up the report a bit, because you guys make a total mess out of the report. But you know, <laughs> but, you know but that, that actually is really great. And the reason why this kind of thing is possible is because of chat ops. <laughs> so yeah. Um, you know, but what kinds of other things can we also integrate uh, into our chatbot being a security company. So uh, any kinds of scanning and exploitation tools. So uh, are you interested in using, I mean, Nmap I mentioned uh, already. Uh, and, but we also, you know, things like uh, web scanners like W3AF. Uh, also, uh, you know, SQL injection uh, tools like uh, SQL Map. You know, Hydra for brute forcing passwords. These kinds of things. You know, we've even implemented uh, Hash cracking and rainbow tables, you know, that can be accessible through uh, through our chatbot, <laughs> which is great because again, I mean, it basically means that uh, folks who are authorized to use those commands then can basically, uh, you know, access rainbow tables, and of course, all that is extremely storage intensive. But I mean, it, it, I can do it. I can do it for my cell phone. <laughs> you know, that's that's the beauty of this. <laughs> So it basically you know, takes all of the, what you can do via your servers, and, and it, as long as you've got a web browser, you can basically access all of it. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier, by the way, people who are authorized to be able to do it. <laughs> uh, we've also implemented access control uh, for our commands uh, that the chatbot can accept. Uh, very important. <laughs> so we're using basically standard uh, role-based access control. Um, you know, because obviously the commands that my pen testers should be able to carry out on our systems <clears throat> are not necessarily the same things that I want my project managers carrying out, and is also not the same thing as I want my customers, <laughs> you know, to be able to carry out. <laughs> you know, and, and also with things like uh, with our project management team, <clears throat> I mean, we actually have implemented all kinds of tools also for project management via the chatbot. And uh, I mentioned already that we've got uh, Rocket Chat and GitLab, but sort of the third part of our little holy trilogy of chat ops is uh, the CAN board. <laughs> so we use Kanban uh, within our company to manage the workflow <clears throat> of projects coming in. And uh, we've actually made it so we can query the CAN board or update the CAN board you know, via the chat. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. And even better, so. Is anybody here familiar with the ship at Squirrel? Anybody? Okay, one person, <laughs> two people. Okay, so, <laughs> so the ship at Squirrel is, so if you use things like Slack, um, you can basically say uh, Hubot ship it, and then it prints this picture of a squirrel. That's it. <laughs> so it's completely silly, but it's actually like a way of being able to celebrate the fact that you've just shipped something. You know, and, and for us, you know, we like to ship stuff. Like we just shipped a quote or we just shipped a pen test report. You know, for you guys it could be shipping code um, or deploying something. But, uh, you know, what we've actually done is we've taken this ship at Squirrel and we actually created a coupling so that when people say uh, raw spot ship it, it actually, if it's in a quotation channel, it will actually take that item on the can board and it will automatically move it to done. So it's actually a way of being able to, uh, you know, as a byproduct, be able to maintain, you know, some of our systems for project management and workflow management in a way that actually our pen testers like doing it, because <laughs> you know, squirrel. So, <laughs> so you know that that kind of stuff. You know, we've also created a spear phishing suite uh, that's completely accessible via a chat that can actually take websites, scrape them, convert them into pretexts uh, for phishing emails. Uh, we can also import a list of uh, email addresses, uh, and then we can basically uh, ship the uh, phishing mails. And as people click on these instrumented emails, our web server is basically hooked into our chat. So we can actually see the clicks from the different pretexts coming in in real time. And the cool thing about that is we can actually add the customer into their channel so the customer can actually watch their own employees clicking on the phishing mails in real time. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> so, 
So, uh, you know, so what else can we do? I mean, we also use our chat uh, a little bit like, uh, you know, kind of like um, for, for support desk uh, purposes. So I'm sure some, some of you use Zendesk and, uh, you know, or OTRS or those kinds of uh, systems uh, for managing uh, correspondence. But what we've done is we've actually created a special email address that if we carbon copy or blind carbon copy this email address uh, while sending correspondence to customers, first of all, it'll take that email, it injects a copy of it into the correct GitLab repo for that particular job and that particular customer. And then what it does is it injects uh, uh, an announcement in the appropriate chat room that basically says a new email just was received from this sender at this timestamp with this subject, click here to view it. So you get these real-time announcements then of the correspondence. That's not only cool for my staff, but that's actually also cool for the customer themselves. Because, for example, we're working with a, a large supermarket chain in the Netherlands, and uh, they have, you know, lots of different business units. But the security officers actually want to know what's going on between with our correspondence with their different business units. So what happens is when we create a new chat room for this particular customer, we've actually made a scripted it so that uh, uh, it automatically adds the security officers into those new channels. So every single time then this special email address is uh, carbon copied, <laughs> they themselves can actually see <laughs> you know a link to that email and be able to click on it and, and get access to that. Super. Easy. So it actually provides them with more visibility into the correspondence that we're having with, with their own organization. You know, and it costs us almost nothing you know, to do this because this is all automated. You know? This is all scripted. This is all you know, tooling that we created. So that's awesome. You know, another thing also that we have as a consultancy company is we have to log our hours. You know, that's another one of those e eternally, you know, universally hated, you know, by consultants, you know, <laughs> kinds of things, that you, administrative things you have to do. But we've actually made it really easy. So we wrote this command called raw spot charge. So a pen tester can basically say raw spot charge three, you know, for three man hours, uh, you know, uh, looking at input sanitization for this set of routines. <laughs> You know, and then raw spot then says, you know, thank you, pen tester. Uh, you have now, you know, uh, charged three hours. You have now used uh, 14 out of the 56 man hours uh, allocated to this pen test. And then it shows a little, uh, uh, how do I say, a little status bar basically showing you what percentage uh, of the pen test then uh, <laughs> has been used. Now, this is also not just awesome for us because it prevents us from going over scope while, while we're working because they're getting constant reminders of how much time we have left. But it, is also really transparent for the customer. <laughs> it's keeping in mind the customer is also in the chat room. So at the moment that you know the, the pen tester does raw spot charge number of hours, what he was you know explanation, they can also see exactly where what we're spending our hours on, <laughs> and they can and the customer also can see what percentage of time is left, which also is nice because if they see, for example, that 50% uh, of the time has been used up for a particular job that we're doing, then we can it can actually spur a conversation with the customer saying, hey, by the way, we're at the halfway point now. You know, maybe we, we've done this, this, and this. Maybe we haven't done that, that, and that yet. Can you help us prioritize for the time remaining? And again, customers love this. <laughs> and we also love it, too, because it prevents us from going over scope, uh, which, of course, for, for us would be a, a big money loser. It certainly used to be, and this helped us uh, get some uh, uh, costs under control. So other things uh, that we've done with chat ops that are super, and that might also be super for you guys, is uh, error logging, or, or just generic logging even. So we've piped both uh, error logs as well as just debug logging into dedicated channels just for that. So if we get uh, error messages, it gets printed by the chat bot into the chat room, <laughs> and then we can actually literally have conversation about it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> as the folks are fixing it. Super. <laughs> you know, really super. Uh, you know, also other things, uh, we've implemented a man-like, uh, sort of Unix man-like uh, help menu uh, also for the chat because, of course, with so many commands, you need some way of being able to keep them all organized and uh, documented. So uh, we've also implemented uh, something like that as well. And, uh, but, you know, the sky is the limit when implementing these kinds of uh, commands. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the question is, what is the limit for this stuff? You know, and if you really want to get researchy about all of this, I mean, imagine if you could implement 
AI, you know, with some of these chatbots. <laughs> you know, imagine then, you know, if it could do some amounts of, you know, scripted conversations or maybe even natural language processing. Imagine how chatbots maybe in the future could be used for things like onboarding new staff members, <laughs> you know, and being able to answer, answer frequently asked questions or being able to onboard, you know, customers or even be able to have customer satisfaction surveys, but not in an annoying way, but in a way that if they give an answer that surprises you, there's actually a human being there in the chat room who can ask for more clarification, <laughs> you know? So this kind of stuff, I mean, we see lots of possibility in it. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the kind of funny thing is we're a pen testing company, but we are actually also a DevOps company, <laughs> you know? And we approach the way that we do our, our tooling and our infra and our, <laughs> you know, all of our development in, I think, the, exactly the same way that probably the majority of the people here in this room do. <laughs> so, but it just so happens that our domain is security uh, and uh, pen testing. So we have won a lot of awards for the work that we've done. Um, the ones I think that I'm most proud of are that the uh, Dutch Chamber of Commerce has called Radically Open Security the 50th most innovative SME in the Netherlands, uh, uh, I, well, uh, for a year ago. Uh, well, we've won a whole bunch of other things, but uh, the other one that I'm particularly uh, proud of also is that CIO magazine in the Netherlands also called uh, me the most innovative leader of 2017. Um, so I'm not saying this just to toot my own horn, but I'm saying this because it actually I think is a validation, external validation of all of the things that we're doing. <laughs> and the fact that we've created a consultancy company that's completely not for profit, <laughs> you know, uh, to try and give back to the community, the fact we open source all our stuff, the openness and the transparency, we are putting pressure on the rest of the market, the security consultancy market in the Netherlands to change. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and ultimately, yeah, uh, also with all of our tooling, we're giving all of it away. So I hope that this talk uh, has uh, inspired you <laughs> to think about how chat ops can be applied within your own companies. And uh, at this moment in time, I'd be happy to take some questions. Hi. Um, I have a question uh, about uh, how can you uh, maintain focus with so many different rooms for uh, every different uh, problem you can uh, have during your workflow. So it's very useful because you have different uh, different um, scopes for different problems. But how you personally can, can manage this uh, workflow? How can I personally manage the workflow when there's so many chat rooms and there's so much going on? Okay, good question. Um, there are a lot of chat rooms, but uh, the chat software highlights them when there's activity in them. So I actually only have to look at the chat rooms that are active. The other thing also is that uh, if people specifically mention me, I can also see from the chat software that people mentioned me. So you're right, there's a lot going on in my company and I can't necessarily read all the channels all the time. The company's too big for that now. Uh, but generally what I do is I prioritize things in this order. First, direct messages. <laughs> so if somebody actually really wants to get a hold of me, then it's via DM. That's what I read first. The second thing that I, the next thing that I read after that are the company channels. So we have basically, um, so in our case, it's, it's Ross dash star, and, and star can be, so we've got Ross project management, Ross pen testers, Ross, you know, this and that and the other thing. So I read the Ross star channels next. After that, I read the pen star channels. So we have pen uh, for pen test, so then pen dash star. And then, so it's, and, and again, we've got a canonical naming scheme for, uh, for this stuff to uh, help us keep it organized. And usually it's pen uh, dash customer name dash project name. So that's generally the, you know, uh, and we uh, use that same uh, unique identifier, uh, basically it's the identifier for, for the Rocket Chat channel and for the Git GitLab repo and for the CAN board. So we actually call it a triad uh, <laughs> uh, within our company. Uh, and we also hook that all, also up to the uh, email system, that uh, support desk thing that I was uh, telling you about. But uh, that, that sort of helps us uh, to maintain, uh, to tame some of the chaos, <laughs> you know, uh, the fact that I don't have to look at everything all the time. I've also got, of course, uh, probably about five project managers, <laughs> which helps, <laughs> you know, the, the fact that I don't have to do it uh, all myself and they divide up the work. We also have the CAN board, uh, you know, uh, there's still improvements in how we can be using the CAN board, but uh, you know we're 
still building more tooling for it, and uh, you know we, we get more efficient over time. So, thank you. Well, uh, let's say we have time for one more question. Hi. So, uh, first of all, um, I happen to work at GitLab, so oh, cool. <laughs> um, it feels great to to feel like another company who's very transparent and open, uh, like you guys are. So, it's great. Um, and my question is more on the operational side of things, like. How do you actually run Hubot? Uh, for instance, we at Gila.com we use uh, we have a Cog instance that we we run on a different data center, running commands, um, segregating containers. So yeah, uh, <laughs> how do you how you how do you deal with that aspect of things? We're, we're actually busy refactoring it at the moment <clears throat> for OPSEC reasons. <laughs> we actually have, believe it or not, multiple bots. And we've actually divided things up into uh, dev test prod because <laughs> uh, we're actually starting to, uh, I mean, again, for, for us, it, this stuff is production. <laughs> and if our bot goes down, then basically our company goes down. <laughs> so, you know, in a way. So, you know, for us, I mean, we're actually busy working right now, first of all, on uh, getting an entire continuous integration uh, workflow <laughs> going, uh, you know, to actually make sure that, uh, well, I mean, when we're making changes to it, if, if somebody makes a mistake, it's not going to bring the whole thing down. Um, the other thing also that we're work busy uh, refactoring right now is also we're trying to integrate uh, containerization. <laughs> and we're actually trying to then be able to run the bots in containers because the problem is those bots, you know, if they have too many rights, you know, the thing is somebody can hack the bot. <laughs> you know, and we have before. <laughs> you know, because I have a company full of pen testers, and my pen testers, when, they, when they're bored and have nothing else to do, will hack our own systems. And I can't tell you the number of disclosures we've made on Rocket Chat, <laughs> you know, of stuff that we found. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but the, the, to make a long story short, I mean, we also need to get that stuff isolated, you know, and away from, uh, you know, uh, our file systems and, and, and the rest of our critical uh, resources. So uh, that, that's probably the best uh, description I can give you. I mean, it's sort of a moving target at the moment uh, that we're putting a lot of work right now into uh, uh, adapting. So. Okay, I'm sorry, but we do not have any time for more questions uh, because, uh, yeah, it's already time for the coffee break in the other room there. And uh, so thank you, uh, Melanie. Thank you.